we shouldn't waste people's time particularly children's time i think we are doing a lot of that today we're wasting their time that bit needs to be changed quickly if we want to get better productivity in society india is a young nation the average age of the indian population is 29 with half of them below the age of 25 With such a young population, a lot of emphasis has to be put into educating India's future generations. Everything else has evolved, but we purposefully not allowed education to evolve. many kind of studies show that you know there is a almost like 10 to 15 if not 20 years gap between what the schools teach you know in indian context uh, and what uh, you know the the market or the society needs there are good institutions there been good education what is connection what is missing is the connection between problem that must be solved versus problem that are interesting to solve I don't see why we want to push our children into our past instead of going with them into their future. It's absurd if you think about it. Within a span of 30 years, the Indian government managed to deliver schooling to a record number of children. But the quality of teacher education is lacking behind. A new way of training teachers is underway. but time is running out till yesterday till 10 years ago till 25 years ago kids from such socio economic background didn't have the opportunity to, do, to go to a classroom today they're going to a classroom right uh, the, today you have teachers it's inadequate you know it's certainly not enough to compensate for the disadvantage that they bear with right but it's way better than what was there 20 years ago we keep sort of uh, Uh, ranting about it in this country that our education system is in shambles which it is in many in very many ways but then we should sometimes stop and look back and say look the fact is while there are lots of problems we've also come a long way because these these kids uh, the kids from the most disadvantaged families they had no opportunity to go to school 25 years ago and almost all of them have the opportunity so now what we have is we have jobbers for education how come through the reservation thing how have they come through what is the cut off you have to have 45% marks your understanding of a subject has to be only 45% to be eligible to teach that subject on the reservations that really is is something you can't touch uh, there is a strong perception in many sections of indian society that centuries of discrimination need to be undone and it'll take centuries before you can give it up so reservations may well be here to stay that's 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 for a while going to be the case but the question that comes to mind after that is um whoever you bring in whether you bring them in through reservations or whether you bring them in through any other means how do you train them and it's in the training that we have been somewhat deficient there was a study done by the justice verma commission in the state of maharashtra about 6 uh, 7 years ago um in which they studied something like 390 teacher training colleges and recommended 300 of them were so bad they should be closed down so if you're not training your teachers properly how do you expect the teachers to teach properly basically these these licenses most of these licenses were really sold there was deep corruption and these private operators who bought these licenses so to say they really had no interest in running a teacher education college they had no interest in conducting a good b ed program they just wanted a license by which they will offer you know admit students and they'll offer degrees and they'll make money out of it the ba that we had designed is a very poor curriculum so the curriculum it has to be it that itself has to be redesigned and uh, uh, that redesigning of the curriculum how it has to be redesigned is is understood but to implement it, it, it basically it's going to go from a uh, roughly 18 month course to four year course it will take about 10 years for this transition to happen I get criticized for saying he doesn't like teachers. That's not the case. If we don't have as many as we need, then we have to find another way.
Someone who has found another way is Abhijit Sinha. As the founder of Project Defy, he has set up makerspaces called Nooks across India and even Uganda. In these makerspaces, children can choose their own curriculum and get the skills required to bring value to their communities at a very young age. This is, I guess, the most challenging project. Um, hopefully this will eventually turn into a drone, but um, this is quite a big leap to take. Um, and we're all a little bit nervous uh, of how they will actually do it, but uh, seems super interested in, in making the drone. So in the image it's surrounding, um, a lot of challenges have been tackled, um, but currently they they want to optimize, they want to uh, maximize on their energy, the the you know so that they don't waste energy, they they're able to use it uh, to the best optimum. Uh, but then once you go out, then there's many 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 challenges right outside of the campus. You know, starting from water to heat and. Um, Almost everything is a is a is a challenge, and then ultimately the bigger challenges like livelihood uh, will start coming in. So the space is um, in some way as a, a support mechanism also for the REZ, um, so that people who need skills and expertise can come here and get that, and actually build all the machines they need to, to be able to produce what they want to produce. At this point, it is just trying to to stabilize and uh, have its routine, keep things happening and uh, keep solving the smaller challenges that are around um, and get that sort of first confidence. Uh, once these 15, 20 people get confident with making stuff, solving challenges, um, building things without like, you know, major support from, uh, from an expert or something, then they will help other people do the same thing. And then it has a potential to, to impact a uh, far more number of people directly. And then of course, uh, indirectly to the families and, and the larger community. They don't just come here to make, um, they actually come here to build their main education, that they're learning. So this space give them, gives them a point to switch from a boring instruction-led uh, system of education where all of their learning is dependent on you know, the school they go to, which is usually not great, to taking control of their learning and start um, self-learning. It is not about um, which system is better? It is about can each individual figure out what works for himself or herself. Let people make decisions for some time. We've, for a very long time now, we have kept control in the hands of a few and made the others follow. Let's see when that is not there. And then what happens? And in a nook, in a safe space, uh, letting that happen um, is probably a, a great way to see it uh, and a great way to observe it. Um, and then if it works, well, Fantastic. If it doesn't, we we'll learn something from it. With Project Defy, Abhijit has managed to uplift many different communities by allowing people to learn at their own pace and learn the skills that are relevant for them to thrive within their own circumstances. Abhijit is part of a new wave of education in India where learning by doing is at the center of the curriculum. I think the future education will have uh, three uh, major components. The first one is that uh, we are going to go away from a top-down vertical approach to learning, that is, you know, a teacher, you know, and a student approach. And instead, it's going to be much more lateral, uh, where students learn in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion from each other. Uh, the second component is that it's going to be learn by doing, so that's why we have places like here, Makerspace, where students can learn science, technology, engineering, and a subject like that in a much more hands-on fashion, uh, as opposed to you know, learning the theory first and try to you know, apply that. And the third important uh, you know, component of uh, the future of education is uh, self-learning. That is, you learn at your own pace, uh, you learn in a just-in-time fashion. So it's a just-in-time learning as uh, evolving your life, you, know, you want to acquire new skills. So you kind of have this ability to learn new skills as you go, you know, and you know, you know advance in your life. And self-learning, by the way, is also about learning about yourself. Uh, so it's not less just about learning like, you know, specific subjects like, you know, uh, mathematics or engineering or something like that or skills, but learning uh, to become more aware of yourself. So the self-knowledge will also be part of the future of education. The Maker's Asylum is one of the most successful maker spaces in India. Every year, the Maker's Asylum hosts Team School, 
where students from different backgrounds come together to find solutions for the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. It's actually been very beautiful in the way that we've gotten support from all of these organizations and NGOs who love the idea. Uh, the French government who believes in us to be able to say that, hey, let's do it, let's give it a shot, let's try it, and let's see where we go. One of the basic exercises that we do is similar to design thinking, but a little bit more that we focus on the crazy ideas as well. And when they come up with that crazy idea, we don't discourage them, we tell them that, okay, fine, it's okay, do it. Build it, let's build it. Because the next workshop that immediately after that that we do is called Jugar or paper prototyping. In the model world, we call it paper prototyping. I like to call it Jugar because it's exactly that. We take scrap and we make a small little prototype of the same thing. Because that's when you really realize what's wrong with it or if it can even work. And that's where you really come up with something exciting and interesting as well. Uh, it's a quick fix, but that's the point. It needs to be a quick fix. You don't want to get too attached to it. You want to be able to make something to be able to destroy it. And uh, the power of a paper prototype or a Jugar solution is that it is a very beautiful learning experience because you've created something with your own hands, you've tested it out, and you're able to show people what that thought is and uh, able to get inputs on it. The moment you start getting inputs from other people, you're constantly learning and seeing what's making it not work. And then you're trying to figure out other things. I think it brings together the entire STEAM phenomena of science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, and you're learning that. But by putting it together in sort of a quick way, and I think that's a beautiful way to learn how to learn. We need that ability to learn and adapt all the time because as we go in a certain way, things get automated. Things will get more and more automated. We will be what would be necessary for us to survive, I guess, on this planet now would be to figure out newer paths and newer ways of doing things. I would like it to be more of a learning lab which brings together people from around the world to be at one place and try out all of those crazy ideas as much as possible and be able to learn freely, build freely over here and possibly get a diploma at the end. This was the education system that made this condition, you know, from industrial revolution to production and consumerism to what it has landed up. So therefore, I would like to believe that we should leapfrog all that and usher India and the world into an education system that is more caring, more sensitive, less, you know, commerce and more stewardship of uh, resources, of human beings, of all living beings on the planet. And we don't really need to go through what the West has gone through and to excel in that. We need to open new paths. India has different pioneers of education. One of them is Sugata Mitra, who won the TED Prize for his project called Hole in the Wall. With this project, he proved to the world that groups of children can teach themselves and each other with the use of a computer. His concept, which is famous around the world, is finally being supported by Indian state governments. What it did to our understanding of learning, I think that stands because I, you know, there's evidence from around the world, from tens of thousands of teachers, groups of children huddled around the internet can learn anything by themselves. Everybody knows that now. Let's say five years ago, if I had set up one, uh, except for that school itself, nobody else would have really noticed very much. But this time I set two of them up in two villages in January and by the end of February the Punjab government said we want 80 of these. So I said 80 of what? So they said whatever it is. So I said why? And they said because we interviewed the parents, the village mothers and they said we've never seen this before that our children keep saying I want to go to school. I tell them, you would like to go out and play? And they said, no, 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 I'd like to go to school. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's the internet for you. <laughs> so, I don't know how long we're going to hide from this. Those villages are really worth 
taking a second look at because the change that happened there happened in weeks. So I think there's a great deal of effort that we can save of the world if they can learn from each other faster, better and more easily without much transition cost. And that cannot happen if you charge for every sharing of knowledge, if you make it difficult. It is clear that a digital age requires digital education. But how can India handle the scale of its population? It will not be scaling up uh, with mass production. It will be about scaling out by decentralizing manufacturing, uh, using you know, all these emerging technologies like 3D printing, but also leveraging uh, local ecosystems uh, as a way to create jobs as well. Because with mass production, imagine what happens, right? You have you know, one factory in one region, but the other regions don't benefit about the jobs you create there. Uh, but if you decentralize it, you're going to also decentralize the creation of jobs and uh, you know, economic opportunities are going to also be decentralized. So in a country like India, we should realize that we can't afford to have what we call a two-speed economy, which is you know, some states growing very, very fast and other states you know, lagging far behind. And, uh, but if you have a scaling out strategy, we can make sure that every state participates in the growth story of India. India's largest 3D printing manufacturer, Imaginarium, supports educational programs to inspire a whole new generation of makers. Tanmay Shah believes that a country like India can benefit greatly from this emerging technology which can cater to the diverse needs all around the country. There are very few places in the world where on the same floor, under the same roof, you have this huge variety of, of manufacturing happening where you can make end usable jewelry as well as a medical device and a model of a car and a working washing machine on the same day. So we've been leapfrogging technologies all the while. So we skipped uh, everyone having desktop computers and now everyone has a smartphone in their pocket. So we pretty much skipped one entire technology. Uh, similarly, I believe in manufacturing, while there's a huge setup uh, in niche uh, industries for India, 3D printing gives us the opportunity to take the entire strength of our population, the skilled and educated workforce who can take up new challenges, the communication abilities that we have, and technologies like 3D printing that allow you to adapt every single day. So with the same machine, you could cater to the most in-demand market uh, in that year and the next year you could change literally uh, metamorphose into another industry altogether without having to change your workforce, your capital investments or your location. I believe that India is an amalgamation of many 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 pockets, practically a collection of many universes in themselves. So in one pocket the culture, the language, the needs, the requirement and the resources available which therefore lead to pockets of local wisdom. Each pocket holds into itself everything they need. In the connected world, the best we could do, and as you have correctly articulated, is rather than have a one-size-fits-all solution, which is again the, the downside of mass manufacturing, if we could actually customize to local populations. Many theories have come which say that think global and act local. And nothing applies more to India than that simple phrase. A lot is happening on the education level in terms of the Niti I.O. coming up with the Atal Innovation Machine. Thousands and thousands of schools will now have access to technologies like 3D printing where 5th graders and 6th graders will start bringing their ideas to life or at least gaining the creative confidence to go ahead and make things even if they fail. I mean that's, that's one of the biggest freedoms that you can give someone is the freedom to fail, uh, which in a big way is lacking in a lot of uh, Indians. But if by playing with technology and that is forgiving, that doesn't cost too much, that doesn't tell you that if you failed once, don't ever come close to me again, that will generate the creative confidence in a whole new generation, which is commendable coming from the government. And I think with a closer collaboration between government companies and individual communities, communities that are actually the, the ones who face the problems. When you put these three stakeholders together, 
a lot more can happen we are going to see a lot of products developed for india by small firms small entrepreneurs they're going to make it and, and the products are going to be so localized they're going back to the basics if you look at the high school college students all of them are focused on products things to make their life easier better they want the same things which the west has only cheaper and they want it indianized government gives you the framework and says make education holistic we are not going to grade you year by year they tell you to, before it standard you cannot flunk a student right so now it's the teacher's responsibility how do they make the classes exciting and the government is able to give you an innovation lab maker spaces 3d printing and innovation labs in schools are some of the ways indian education will become more holistic Vivek Reddy and his daughter Indira are taking things a step further. They are opening India's first school of happiness. The Riverbend School, which will be located just outside of Chennai, will offer students a personalized yet holistic curriculum. With subjects like farming and computer programming, the Riverbend School will be very different than the school Vivek Reddy himself went to when he was younger. I came from a very traditional uh, system of education. um 30 40 years ago uh, uh, you know too much respect for authority uh, instilling that we know better and this is the right way and you know the standard ills of education that everybody talks about and basically they took away the joy of childhood from from us you know because school i mean eight hours of the waking day is in school and if that is not joyful then half of your waking day is they've taken it away so the way we approach personalization is um in a few levels if we uh, level the curriculum at the base there be the core that all students need to know that those will be the critical knowledge skills and character that everyone needs to have so that to some extent will be standardized but it won't be as much as the current system has you know it will be it will be just the critical things that they need to know what they need to know at every age and stage in order to live life fully that's how we define the core the second level would be the discovery as we like to call it where we expose kids to different things because they may not even be aware of something that they could be taking an interest in so it's important for us to provide them with that discovery and that exploration um phase and once they have that then we have the mastery because another thing that i i feel is that when you have that one thing that you know you're really good at and uh, you can really develop it adds so much to your confidence and i think as a school instead of trying to make all the students average at everything it's good if they have their basics and are really strong in one or two things because when they go out into the real world they're going to want to have one or two strong things so um so once they have that core once they've ex- been exposed to a lot of things they need to have the mastery which is up to them which is entirely their choice it could be science it could be the arts it could be tennis it could be anything but that time would be for them to develop what they are really good at there's an opportunity to give the kids fun and make them learn and make them really better prepared for a richer life so i think our new plan is that not just fun but infuse that that eight hours with a you know with a lot of relevant learning that will be useful for them for a deeper experience of life so this particular site we feel is so core to that vision to delivering the vision so um, that's how we you know we matched the site to the vision of the school and this is sort of the entrance to the river bend campus both left and right sir. yeah both left and right It's like a empty canvas, right? We just paint on it. So from here, um, maybe going about 200 meters that way, and about 300 meters that way, with the view of the water this way. So uh, this is going to be the campus. 
that's definitely something that I would want to change, you know, to give kids opportunities to be more active, to not necessarily, you know, spoon feed them, but to give them opportunities that they can control their own learning. I think the environment plays a huge role and if you can um, make that better, then, uh, you know, you can really just change, change people's lives. The next 10 years will be pivotal when it comes to India's aspirations of becoming a prosperous nation. The entrepreneurs and innovators in this episode are only a small piece of the big puzzle that is India. Yet they are all optimistic about India's revolution in education. Finding new ways of educating India's young population will be at the heart of its development. I can see a feeling for need of something different, but it's not where people want to put their children in yeah so it's still very early stages therefore it will be a kind of a struggle but that's the fun part also you're doing something that's pioneering that will set the trend india needs to be more dynamic you know change things as it sees the need of rather than waiting for that same thing to happen in uk or new york or london and then only change things. I think India, in that respect, uh, lacks confidence and it's a, a part of a colonial past that you look up to what your masters are doing rather than see that I have a different problem and I have to find my own solution for this. I can be the first. That we don't seem to have. We wait for the West to show us the way, whereas, you know, our problems are different. Our, conditions are different even if they are same we could be the first one to come up with the solution we don't even you know look for that and that's an issue so it may be still not too late to have a you know our government these days comes up with missions every now and then uh, cleanliness mission and digital mission they should have a mission to decolonize the minds of the nation and that's when India will think on its own feet for its own sake, which is not happening now. We'll do it if we believe that that change is required. Uh -huh. But we don't. We, we are still teaching them what Piaget said and what Vygotsky said. Now, they were great men, but uh, shouldn't we allow their ideas to evolve into what would have happened next? I sometimes wonder if if the two of them were alive today, Vygotsky and Piaget, wouldn't they themselves have said, forget that crap, here's what you should do next. Any new introduction to a system creates that ripple. But what's more important right now is, can our schooling change to so that students learn how to learn and that's it. What you learn is always going to keep changing. And uh, But the important thing is to have that skill of knowing how to learn and moreover the desire of wanting to learn. I am confident that with the next generation, India will evolve from a nation of leapfroggers, uh, which I think China is trying to do, uh, be better than the West by using the same textbook and become a nation of uh, trailblazers by actually writing a new textbook that even the West will you know, learn from. I don't think we have to reinvent anything. Things are reinventing themselves. So, we just have to be ready for the fact that a whole lot of things will change uh, in unpredictable directions, whether we want to or not. The reason to call Project Defy, Project Defy, is that the project will at some point end. Maybe that's my fear. <laughs> Maybe that's what I want to see before I die. Um, that the work I want to do with Defy ends. And, and I can see a difference. My worry is that we haven't trained enough good teachers. And until we do that, um, we may not be fully able to maximize the advantages of video learning, massive online courses, internet connection, video conferencing, all of that. The next generation is actually so both smart and I would even say conscious and wise that uh, they are going to, they're going to feel really frustrated and uh, bored by you know, the kind of traditional education system. And so there is a kind of uh, a big tsunami coming, uh, so to speak, a you know, big revolution coming that's going to unfold in the education sector in India. I would say not even in 10 years, but I think it's going to happen, you know, in the next three, four years.